Now we are going to have Michael Dexter telling about the FreeBSD appliance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining late on the last day of the conference. That's always a challenge. Post-lunch, post-Kirk, you name it. My name is Michael Dexter. I'm relatively easy to find. And I've been poking at some of these topics for 20 years. I hope you enjoy this. So please read the paper. It's short and sweet. It is a paper that I wish someone had handed me 20 years ago because it maps out some key things that I had to learn the hard way over the years. It's linked here. It's linked from the BSD CAN site and possibly the Asia BSD Con site where I first gave it. I've given three variations on this talk, or two, and two plus today, but um, they're all very different, so thank you for joining. So high level, briefly, I won't get too hung up in this, but what is a software appliance? Well, it's, it's an application with just enough operating system, and I had not come across that term, JUICE. Uh, J-E-O-S, just enough o uh, operating system, which I think is out of SUSE or somebody. Yeah, that's sweet. Typically on commodity hardware or virtual machine. Um, and that OS is the firmware to achieve a goal, and that's right out of Wikipedia, nothing special. So from a high level, we go from general purpose computing to single purpose computing. Fair enough. And any OS could arguably be the foundation for an appliance. AV team, could you check focus on the projector? It's a lot sharper here than on the projector. Uh, not the camera, the, 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 the beamer. <laughs> oh. Right about there. Uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> cool. <laughs> so just enough OS. So some of the most significant appliances on planet Earth have been built with BSD operating systems, or at least the network stack. Nokia routers, Juniper networking devices, NetApp, open source products and services, and you name it, like TrueOS, FreeNAS, uh, PFSense, OpenSense, plenty of them. They do it for various reasons, and some of them have endured for a very long time quite successfully. BSD gave us the internet. Internet appliances kind of are a natural <laughs> extension of that. So many of them have stayed laser focused on a single purpose and some have sort of strayed and had, I mean, suffered feature creep, if you will. And every appliance vendor struggles with, well, trying to choose one moment in time from an upstream OS, do their thing and balance things like, well, our hardware device has a five year warranty and our We'd love to offer our clients a five-year long-term support contract. Well, and it's not a commercial talk. It's about the raw plumbing. Don't you worry. But those are often competing motivations. It's like, well, what does any given OS that we all came here to talk about look like five years later? That's a very long time. That's an insanely long time. So one thing I've observed working with a storage appliance for 10 years now is that Ultimately, the diagnosing of that appliance comes down to diagnosing that OS, its network stack, its storage stack, all of that. And so the, if the appliance happens to have a beautiful clicky interface, eventually you'll need to just bypass all of that and go right to what's really happening. So that was a, a, a lesson that's behind this. Whoops, sorry, I stepped here. Uh, so if you're working with upstream, forking is expensive. There are a great many uh, vendors in the community who proudly forked long ago, and then they find like, uh-oh, we don't have 64-bit. It showed up upstream, but we don't have it. That's, that, that could be a problem. ZFS came along. That's a rather powerful tool, and if you've strayed off elsewhere and been tinkering with a file system, you might have uh, just had overnight much of your nifty new unique secret sauce features get obsoleted in an instant. Resyncing is expensive. Over the years, there have been quite a few talks in BSD circles of Vendor A is finally getting back to head. Some of them have been brave enough to say, we run head, let's just stay current and deal with the fallout, test appropriately. We all benefit from that because their testing trickles down to the rest of us for something more support. So there's gotta be a middle ground between leading edge, living in the past, you name it. And I'd say one key point is to engage upstream. It's your friend, it's not your enemy, and get involved. And the vendors have been great about that. There have been talks explicitly supported, uh, supported by vendors at this conference. They did not market their products. They just told us what they're doing right. And thank, I'm very 
very grateful for what they're doing. So, ah, just enough. I, that, that's sticking with me. Just enough, just enough. So, what is radically just enough? I mean, uh, let's, let's explore that. So, from my perspective, it's been 20 years of being patient and waiting for certain components to work. I'll touch on a specific one that's taken a very long time. And that's led to extreme impatience now that those things are here. And you get to benefit from that. And also there's a broader theme, please stop computing like it's 2003. Who remembers 2003? Anyone, anyone? People were building world like all the time. And it's like you visit a friend and they're like, oh, building world, there's a white space change in head and we gotta build. It's like, wait, wait, this can't be very efficient. This, 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 no, please. Um, there was this new thing, FreeBSD jail, and there was this new Z NetBSD Zen, purely para-virtualized, and so it was, it was a, a taste of what's to come. And I was obviously excited to look at my talks since 2007 at, at EuroBSD Con onward. I got excited. Uh, FreeBSD 5.1 included jail tools. It's like, wait, we have management tools from the outside. We have everything I've been looking for for years after being burned by R RPM hell. I'll touch on that in a sec. And storage was terrible. Disks were small, slow, I suppose reliable, but uh, things got better. Things got much better. So all that world building, well, hardware's faster. That's a plus. Uh, I, I do notice that if you look at a system, it's like building clang. And you, you look at a build, and it's building clang. And then there's the OS. So there's that. There's that. But the thing I mentioned that's been a bit of a challenge for decades are the build options in FreeBSD. And a build option, which I'll get into detail, is you build a component per your liking. I'll get to that in a sec. So as for the, 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 the teaser of jail and Zen, well, FreeBSD has a hypervisor. It also has active Zen, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, Roger didn't make it to this conference, but it's there. Try it. Give it a try. Please, please. And along came hardware assistance, the uh, pop count and other extensions from Intel and AMD to make that better. There will always be concerns about security issues on x86 hardware from the 80s being virtualized, but that's not a battle I'm fighting. And storage, well, who remembers when ZFS and the one terabyte drive arrived? Life began for a bunch of us because you could meaningfully build large storage with little more than the cost of the hardware. The OS is free of charge, it's very good, it's your friend. And uh, a great many things went out the window. Thanks to that, I'll touch on that briefly. But a 24 base system will do 30 NVMe drives for a lot of money, but compared to the proprietary options, it's magic, it's awesome. So the OS is half the battle and these Popular OSs all have many of these resources. ZFS, they have uh, containers and hypervisors and you name it. And the question becomes, how well do they deliver all that, be it ZFS on a Lumos from which it came or Linux to which it's bolted on, et cetera, et cetera. So Lumos is not following OpenZFS. They cherry pick so they're not significantly missing features, but that's a decision they've made. They might resynchronize. I'm glad that it's no longer ZFS on Linux, and then it was even a problem for FreeBSD. The, uh, has, have people been following the OpenZFS community and the, the <laughs> hand in the back with the AV team? They have, uh, in October, their developer summit. I cannot believe how smoothly they went from pure terror of Oracle taking over Sun to an open project that's running on Windows, Mac OS. I've run on Mac OS for a decade. I was first run on Windows on bare metal hardware. Obviously FreeBSD, Linux, you name it. That's an amazing project. We should all look up to them for like examples of how to like work with each other. It just, it's awesome. I'm not judging anyone there, but it's amazing what they've done. Thank you, Matt Aaron. Seriously, amazing. I'll just slip that in there. So, um, in my circles, storage, uh, when you get to fast wire speed, that bolted on relationship of ZFS and uh, GNU Linux and friends, many colleagues are seeing a 20% performance penalty just right off the bat. So that's not detected at the lower end, but once you really start pushing things, you start running into 
limits. So you have to carefully choose your OS for what you're doing, and I will highlight this certain OS. Illumos zones are awesome. They were inspired by jail, and then they took it like the next step, the next step, the next step, almost to a point that it would be tempting for other OSs to try to import zones. It's really well done. It's beautifully integrated into the network stack. Kudos to Illumos. Thank you very much. They get a lot right. And I'm not here to beat up on GNU Linux, but they have C groups. They have various containers. They've had them for years. OpenBZ, all these different efforts over the years. And some would argue it's not a true jail. It's not just simply kernel level process separation and isolation. It achieves some goals, but not others. So fortunately, jails and zones get a lot right to this day. You know, year 2000 for jails, that's a pretty good run. Nicely done. Hypervisors, Illumos imported FreeBSD Be Beehive. That's a very good sign of success. It's in a contrib branch, like, cool, finally. <laughs> FreeBSD has lots of contrib components. Well, Illumos and has done that. Patrick's been great to work with. And Oxide launched a product with Beehive under the hood. Success. Now, Linux KVM, with all of its massive contribution and funding, and you name it, is a very good hypervisor. It has nested virtualization. It has various processor models. It has lots of firmware. And name a firmware, it probably supports it. That's cool. If you need to develop, say, even Beehive, it was developed on VMware Fusion, great. Use another hypervisor. It might even reveal issues that you wouldn't see otherwise. So that's all good. If you need that, go there. If you can survive without Control-T, just saying, just, just saying, just. Sorry, if I'm to beat up on one thing, sorry. It's like you, you wait at the console and is it frozen? I don't know, I, I don't know. I am curious because I, I need to know. So anyway, so NetBSD, bless their hearts. They, have, they imported ZFS. They have several hypervisors. They were first to the table with Zen, perhaps even before Linux. They have NVMM, they have Haxum. Uh, check out the BeehiveCon talks on those, great. Uh, if any show of hands has someone worked with those, because after this we great, let's talk. <laughs> Keep, submit talks, please, well, I want to hear more. So this is a great start. We're talking about just solid fundamentals to move forward with, and notably FreeBSD, but those others have some special features like KVM. If it has something you need, go there. So to state the obvious, FreeBSD has a permissive license. And I only use like TrueNAS and OpenSense, which are permissively licensed. And I suppose they might have either proprietary optional support contracts and stuff, but I still want completely open source despite there's no obligation to do so. And thank you vendors who have done that. They're doing arguably a better job of GPL compliance without having the requirement. Because of course you share. It's, you're, you, it's self-defeating not to share to all these wonderful people and have their feedback. So open source for the win, maybe? You know, I, I shouldn't have to preach the converted, but when it comes to all these appliances, it matters. And if you have a proprietary appliance, please ask for that GPL compliance package download that they might mail you on a floppy from, from Mudrium, you name it. So like anything, FreeBSD has real and perceived shortcomings and complaints. Uh, there's no nested virtualization. Well, VMware spent like $3 million on that in three years and eventually got it working. Great, <laughs> that's good for them. It added massive complexity, not that their code is open. It's complex in KVM and elsewhere. So that's a very complex feature of questionable value. Apparently you can continuously nest performance grinds to a halt, and I don't know what the use case is, but if you find one and need that, go use KVM. Uh, NFS Ganesha fell out of the ports tree, I think for Python 2 dependencies. It would be great to have that back. Apparently it's got compatible locking models with NFS, so it's like, great, and uh, SMB rather. Um, there's no Docker on FreeBSD, and there's a talk going on uh, with uh, uh, Michael and OCI Images in another room. But I would argue FreeBSD is to blame for Docker. We've had jail for a very long time and proudly used it among ourselves, but didn't reach out and say, hey, this is very useful and someday will define how massive data centers operate, containerizing single applications and you name it, but we still have all those tools, they're fantastic. Um, 
poor support, poor support for poor hardware, I guess. Uh, some of the vendors have been, hardware vendors have been great about FreeBSD support, and much of the hardware that isn't well supported is already terrible hardware, so I don't recommend it. So that's, I guess, a complaint, sort of, maybe. And there are fewer GUI management tools, which I guess guilty as charged. Fair enough, but I'm also going to talk about how we can improve that. So, no subject of this talk. So, back to just enough single computing OS. Uh, I mentioned, yeah, FreeBSD 5.1, the jail tool, JLS, JEXEC. It was human friendly rather than guessing and praying you could SSH in and all the acrobatics we did back in the four days. Um, the moment that worked, and my motivation was just RPM hell. I mean, one, on a RPM-based distro, you can install software but never remove it. That's a problem. So containing it was the answer. And if you have a dedicated container for a web server, you probably don't need a tool chain GCC back then. You probably don't need a whole lot of things. So let's invert that and look at the bare minimum. So I discovered build options, I gave them a try, and it was rough. They, they didn't work uh, very well for actually many years. However, I love the free uh, Red Hat 5.2, not to be confused with Red Hat Enterprise Linux that came long later. It was fully packaged and ergo fully inventoried. So the OS what would have a default install and you could explain where everything came from. That's cool. That's great for learning it. I like that. Very cool. But as I just mentioned, once you add OSs on top of that pile, uh, applications and packages, you have very little chance of removing them successfully and fully. And uh, yeah, contain containment was obviously critical real early. FreeBSD package base, there have been counting five implementations and six if you count a joke one. So it's possibly here in 14, there are test builds out there. Uh, it's been a lot of hard work by some very dedicated people, so we can probably have that excitement too. But build options, which I touched on earlier. So, uh, show of hands, is anyone familiar with build options? About half, excellent. So, uh, the BSDs are unified operating systems. Everything is in one little directory. You know, all the sources are right there. You can do a recursive search for a, a function and get an answer and act on it. Or you can make changes across the whole OS without asking dozens of other projects. <laughs> Very cool, that works. So a build option uh, defined in the source.conf manual page, for example, without Beehive. And it's like, well, don't build the Beehive. So uh, maybe you, that's just a random component example and it's only on 64-bit. I guess come 15 that will be uh, the, the default. And you say simply in your source.conf without beehive equals yes, and it doesn't build it. Now, beehive builds very quickly. The tool chain builds very slowly. It feels like it's three quarters of the modern build. So that's the kind of thing you want to exclude. Under the hood, it's in a make file. And this is where I've spent five plus years chasing bugs. Uh, simply, oh, if someone said no beehive, don't build these components. And those are hard to get right, and developers often forget that this mechanism exists. So maybe a component, you add a third component, but then you forget to add the option, and then the build breaks, and it's been very frustrating. But it's been working since 13.0. 12, hopeless, but it's also end of life. But moving forward, it's been rock solid. So you can use build options to cut the OS down to nearly nothing using completely in-base tools. That's the build, that is the official build, not tinkering with it, not removing stuff. And so with my weird project names, I came up with Occam BSD or Occamization, call it what you want, but it's, a, I, I, I make a list of the options, remove two or three that just are required for the build, and then build, start building. So the initial system cannot be booted. Okay, well then you add what's needed to boot it and you work your way back up using completely in base tools. And then it occurred to me, wait, I could add hardware support. Well, why not? You need uh, a few, just a few components for bare har minimum hardware support. You might want networking, well add in networking. You might want only IPv6, add in only IPv6. So 
Uh, that's been fun and, you know, flashbacks to CS 101. I was like, this is, this is hands on. The hard work is done and there are opportunities to fix things and contribute. So it's like, this is great. So on any modern hardware, you can build kernel and world in a few minutes on something like a AMD Epic, very, very uh, single digit minutes. Uh, you get a, a working bootable OS, be it under obviously a jail with no kernel, tiny, or a VM image, 150 or so megabytes, boot times in seconds. Thank you, Colin Percival, for the boot time work. Anyone, anyone? He's got it, he first profiled it, and then it's like, why are we spending time here? Let's see if we can speed that up. So bless his heart. Thank you, Colin. Um, when I got this working, I thought, oh dear, there will be this unrecognizable carcass. I'm like, that's the BSD43 from college. It's just a few little things, the directories, you know, Etsy directories, tiny, bin directory, tiny. I'm like, this is great. This is full circle. I love it, as opposed to what's left, the, the carcass, yes. And it was very educational. So when you do this, you're like, why do I have a, a network card management tool when I have no networking or drivers? So you can find abandoned components that just need a simple little entry to say, hey, we need to make file entry to skip this if we're not doing networking, because it's kind of implied, you'd have it. Um, uh, undocumented components. You look at the manual pages on one machine, you look for what's left. If it's not documented, it's not documented. That's a problem. Uh, Cross-building issues. It reveals what issues you might have because FreeBS, modern FreeBSD cross-builds beautifully. Congratulations, whoever's responsible. Go team. That's awesome. I realized a little rescue ISO for like IPMI and such. I don't need a tool chain to do that. So one can quickly throw packages and you can put packages from a future version of the OS, say 14 on 13, uh, package is smart enough to say, okay, this is 14, I'll give you a 14 package. It's great, it's awesome. So I'm happy, sorry, I'm excited. It's, it's like I've waited a long time for these things. Antronig in Armenia uh, found that for a classroom, well, here's a simple OS, the basics, work your way back up, very helpful. He confirmed that in person with students, actual students, and FreeBSD has been good about reproducible builds. Reproducible builds, not with complete coverage, I think. Edmast was very active and then got distracted, perhaps, I don't know. But if you're going to be doing unholy things to the OS, anything you haven't changed shouldn't change. So if a reproducible build can mean that the, the release engineering official ISO snapshot has a certain binary that you haven't changed, those should be identical for the win. Moving on, uh, start here, literally. So um, these base components are what every FreeBSD user uses by turning on the machine. If, if it's the base kernel, that's, that's them. So if you're going to audit them, if you're gonna review them, if you're gonna teach them, if you're gonna do a, a book about them, start there. It's, it's the bare minimum because a modern OS and, and the tool chains and all that are massive. They're absolutely massive, so it's, it's really fun, dare I say, to just cut it down and work your way back up. So, you can find it there. I'm just, it's a tool, 20 years in the making. I've, I've ended up with profiles because it's like these drivers to boot to hardware, these to do ZFS, these, 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 these. And then there is new magic, and I'll, I'll talk quite a bit about this. VM image support, and uh, so Occam BSD will support uh, ZFS-based root images. Um, in the README, having looked at this for 20 years, I looked up Nano BSD, Pico BSD, Tiny BSD, Crochet, Poetry Image, which is actively maintained, Make Jail. People have been looking at this, you know, for years, and they've had their reasons. Uh, the FreeBSD router project came up in a recent talk. Great, he's doing good work, and it can be done with in-base tools. I've not added a single thing to FreeBSD to achieve this. Yay, FreeBSD for the win in this case. Um, for me, it's been inspiring. I gave a talk at Fossey on falling in love with FreeBSD again, because hey, we have really cool tools to play with, and that's why I'm all excited up here telling you about them. So, um, in this optimized view of the world, 
Uh, you build your world, you build your kernel as you always would, but you just build a lot less. And you can install world like we did back in the day with jails. You wait and install a jail and set it up, da, 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 or generate a VM image because Glenn Barber's release tools generate virtual machine images, or they're called virtual machine images. And over the years, something, something, VMDK, QCOW2, and copy on write, and VHDX, and OCI, and a tarball, and a mountable, all this stuff. Well, we have ZFS. ZFS throws those all out the window. We don't have to worry anymore. Between raw images and ZVOLVs, we have what those aim to achieve. We have the snapshots. We have the encryption. We have all these things that were kind of bolted on and then any two hypervisors, I'm surprised how few support raw images, but they each have their own format and you can convert the format, but why, why? So this VM image, and I put in, in parentheses for good reason, it's a boot image. It's not a, you, you can do it on a virtual machine, but it's a boot image, nothing more, nothing less. So all this virtualized storage. No, it's storage. ZFS does so much of this heavy lifting for us that just do it. Imagine it, do it. VM image, it's a boot image. And I, I love how FreeBSD gets this right. So thank you, Mark Johnston. I don't think he's in here, but MakeFS, thank you, NetBSD, for MakeFS, it has sprouted root on ZFS support. So an unprivileged user can generate a bootable image after they've built world and all that root on ZFS, on that image, and that image can go anywhere. Uh, Colin, late yesterday, said Percival said there might be a little corruption issue, so I, I, I need to jump, jump on that, but clearly we all want to fix that before 14, so there's time. So here's the syntax right out of the release tools. Um, if you want a source.conf, great. If you want to use your own kernel configuration file, great. The heavy lifting is with VM image with images, yes. Format, raw. I personally could not, I never want to see a QCOW2 or a VMDK or all those things again. That we, we've solved it, it's there. If it's on a compressed file system, ZFS with LZ4, the compression's there. It's, it's, it, and anyway, good stuff, good stuff. And then the root partition and a swap partition. Simple. So it's raw format. Can anyone name a, an OS other than FreeBSD that can boot legacy and UEFI with the same install? Are there any? I can't find one. So FreeBSD just doesn't care. It's like pick one in BIOS and go. That's it. It works. That's nice, especially when you're going through generations of hypervisors that might only support BIOS legacy, you name it, or only UEFI like Beehive. They get that right. So. Hypervisor boot and hardware boot are indistinguishable for that block device, and you can drop that block device on a hardware device and just boot it. And it's a real system. It's not, it's not a shim, it's not a trick, it's not a bunch of nonsense. So, someone's like a, a snarkily, imagine that. So I have a tool I've been maintaining for about a year of imagine SH. It retrieves an official image from any branch of FreeBSD, it drops it down as is, or it drops it down expanded, or it drops it to hardware, which lets you choose which device, like a stick in a USB SATA drive, make that your boot drive for a server. And uh, for me, I don't want to see the installer again. I've just blasted right past it. If it's root on ZFS, I can expand it to fill my 120 gig boot drive. It's like, no more installing, and then configure it from there. It has some basic defaults like DHCP configuration, you can intrude in and set SSH and you name it, and I'll get to that in a sec. So uh, that has sprouted, I don't know what that was, that has sprouted Debagin, <laughs> I need a better name, I always have terrible names. Debian, the project, those Linux folks, GNU Linux, produce no cloud images, which means no password, by the way, which is fine, like the FreeBSD one, so do set a password before you put it in the wild. But those images are available raw. Those images, I haven't tried a legacy, but they have UEFI support. They work equally in Beehive on a physical boot drive. It's just a raw image. You expand it as appropriate, and off you go. So for doing pretty much anything with FreeBSD or Debian in the lab, it can be very quick, a few minutes just to 
without inter interaction, just take an official image and splat it down and rinse and repeat to regression tests, do whatever you got to do. So the whole process with Occam BSD and Imagine, and this is all stock tools. You, I scripted it my way, you can script it your way. I'm not pushing anything here. You build the OS, build world, build kernel, release, make the image, and you put out the image to the bootable device. That's it, that's the whole process. It, it, there's no, uh, you, can, you can configure it either in your sources or at a late stage or after it's installed, it's up to you. So that choice is awesome if you're trying to get the OS to very quickly, repeat, reproducibly do something you want without a whole lot of hand-holding. What happened? Okay, so uh, I said, hey, Debian, yes. They have a nonprofit fiscal sponsor. And given the recent drama in the I'll just say operating systems community. That's really refreshing. And if it comes down to FreeBSD with its foundation and Debian with software in the public interest, I'm like, I'd rather work with those people than some dot-com funded distro that years on might decide that they're suddenly upstream and you shouldn't ever rebuild their software. I'm like, what? <laughs> We're open source people. I, I literally don't understand the sentence. So they've worked very hard on zero trust builds. They start with like a 200 line hex file that is more or less human readable for those who celebrate hex. And then they build up the entire tool chain from there. If you want zero trust, we have it within reach with uh, the, the, I think it's uh, either bootstrapping.org and these guys, and it's easy to find on GitHub. Plus Cherry Build, the Cherry project, Cherry uh, out of uh, Cambridge, is it? Uh, they are cross building like a, like a storm. <laughs> on Mac, on Debian, you name it. So uh, there's some very good work there to cross build FreeBSD outside of FreeBSD. So if you're getting it, if a Debian image just shows up and you can zero trust, you build your tool chain and then from there build an image, it's, it's easy, it's easy. So uh, FreeBSD is remarkably Debian friendly insofar as, or Unix in general, but maybe they use XFS, blah, blah, blah. So with Debian specifically, <laughs> Uh, there are tools to mount ext4 file systems, create them, resize them like I'm discussing. Uh, they have something called the fully automatic installer. That's what's generating those no cloud images. If anyone needs a pet project for like the next few weeks, whatever, please build dev1, the dev1, the, the non-system de Debian, because that would be really nice for those using it in jails. And there's very clear open ZFS project root on ZFS for Debian. The project isn't doing that. It would be great to include that. So there's a little project. Create some boot images just like release engineering is doing for FreeBSD as of September 1st. <laughs> it's like this is, this is new. This is arriving as we speak. So a term I like for all this is just owning the stack. If your entire source tree is in this directory, then you can build it and put it on an image. You can just step back and make meaningful changes across it. Again, rather than hoping to talk to dozens of projects that may have never spoken to one another. We have FreeBSD and Linux APIs at our disposal. The Linux compatibility in FreeBSD is quite good. We have containers, have for 23 years, and virtual machines. And again, ZFS is doing a lot of heavy lifting for us. So, a bunch of us meet every week, and wow, there was pent up excitement about jail. Mecca can confirm. Uh, jail hasn't changed a lot. And it's not for want of change, or it's, you know, it's just not clear where that source of change would be. Um, NullFS sprouted the ability to mount a file in a, another file system rather than a directory, which has some neat implications for building minimal user lands that are the things you need, nothing more, nothing less. Um, Thank you, Jamie, for adding the dot .include functionality. Uh, Mecca, who's in the room, had a very sophisticated component to balance a bunch of configuration files. And the group stepped back and thought, well, what if you could simply specify, I want to include this in my jail configuration? And that arrives in FreeBSD 14. It went from idea to code in a matter of weeks. So this whole user-friendliness thing, 
uh, any appliance with pretty gooey and all that has changed typically over the years. So they move stuff, they can make it, they make it interactive, they make it all stuff, 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 stuff. Well, I personally, I've done certain things the same way for 20 years. Not everything, but certain things I learned at once and, you know, user training. Let's talk about that, user training, 10 minutes, great. Uh, someone said you just comment this out or change this and that SSH config is my example here in the lab. Yeah, Root can get in the lab. Uh, and I learned it once. That knowledge has worked for like decades. I like that, you know. Uh, I think I talk about little dogs here. FreeBSD has been very good about the principle of least astonishment pull a multi-decade muscle memory works for me. I love it, it's great. Uh, something, something about old dogs and new tricks. They now have a new formula for ca calculating dog years and I'm now 250 using that calculation. So I don't want to learn like the new GUI for, no, you know, just the different GUI for different differences sake. Like really? And there is always the easy button. If you have this awesome OS stack that does so much for you, Ansible, Ansible NAS, great, Webmin. Webmin's alive and well. It's still there, still Perl. Uh, a little hint I learned, the Solaris packages will work on uh, Illumos without much effort. Like, that's cool, that's cool. And moving on, Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Terraform, all these cool components. I'm like, okay, I didn't install it, but I'm like, package, add, Terraform. It's like one, one component. That's cool. And I hope I got the right one. Package install, Python 3.9, Ansible. It's like, okay, a dozen or so components and a few more for Puppet. And I don't know if that's the right chef, and I don't even know if I can read it, but it was package, package install Ruby gem chef. And there are pages and pages of dependencies. And that scares me. <laughs> I don't know if it's the age, 250 years or what, but the, no, and it's not to be confused with the chef package, which is like seven kilobytes. That's the Swedish chef dictionary. So <laughs> it's like borky, borky, borky. So don't confuse those, don't confuse those. So, all this configuration management, we're configuring, we're, we're deployment, managing, managing, managing. Well, what are they doing? It's, it's with the dozens of packages, there must, they must be doing a lot. Well, a lot of it is item potence. And this came up very beautifully in Dave uh, VCH's talk yesterday. Item potence, uh, you set a desired state and you work to achieve it, that's it. And I get that all these management things need to make 10 Linux distributions behave the same way. I don't have that problem, <laughs> I'm good. I, I'm, I'm willing to invest in Debian, I'm willing to invest here and in the BSDs, but this idea of making everything work the same, I, I don't have that problem. So FreeBSD has sysrc for safely managing RC files and you like, okay, uh, sysrc hostname equals this and you can check, which is nice, so is it the correct host name? Yes, it is, great. But it's not item potent, and, and here's how you work around it, but I will submit a PR, like let's make it item potent. Uh, does it have to be changed? Nope, we're good. If you have to change it, you change it, as simple as that. Um, the most amazing thing in computer science is when you have to do nothing. If the host name is correct, nothing, zero, not a thing, it's great because you can do nothing efficiently all day long. It's, it's fantastic. So you set the state, you work to achieve it. Fetch, fetch is awesome on FreeBSD. Along with uh, libarchive, you can like open up ISOs and other stuff. You just throw stuff at it. But when you compare an on-disk file to upstream that's retrieving from, it compares them, yay. But if it's missing, it, it complains and fails. It's like, well, you're fetching something. By definition, you're trying to get software from upstream, so don't worry about if it's not being there. It's like that's what you're there for. So I'll, I'll try and do a PR on that. So in this whole notion of owning the stack, it's a foundation for lots of nifty tools. And yes, the world wants web interfaces, web sockets, and REST APIs, and mechanical APIs. Great, great, great. Some human readable, some mechanical, machine to machine. Great, I'm not disagreeing. So a huge epiphany in my storage experiences. Smart control, it's neither human nor machine readable. <laughs> like, that, nope, <laughs> please don't do that. Um, then they added JSON support, like, great, I can parse that. Then they modified the schema without updating a version number. It's like, no, no, you're so close, so close. So 
we have this foundation. And on top of that, FreeBSD has been sprouting libxo, uh, structured output simple commands. So if you want JSON out of JLS, thank you, Juniper, you can do it. Uh, there are a few things in ports that handle it. That coverage is limited, I'll admit. But uh, there was a, a fervor a few years ago, but it's coming along. Open ZFS JSON status output is coming. Uh, I'm very happy about that. If you're dealing with ZFS at scale, that's awesome. Fantastic. Thank you, Clara and company. Now, moving on. Uh, UCL, there was a big push a few years back, universal config language. It really didn't make it very far. CTLD, the uh, storage framework in FreeBSD that does iSCSI fiber channel and, and other neat things with uh, Beehive supports it, IOV CTL. Uh, NVList support is showing up in Beehive config if you want those mechanisms. Now, where are we at? Where are we at? So, uh, this whole just enough OS, yeah, we can tear it down to unbootable and work our way back up. We have Linux and FreeBSD APIs at our, at our disposal. Yes, there might be some limits on Linux always and system D and you name it. Um, we have pads for reducible builds. I just didn't have time to, zero trust builds. I didn't have a chance to try that. Um, we have our containers. NullFS mounts have like innovated in tiny, awesome little ways. I'm wrapping up, don't worry. <laughs> so. <coughs> In base item potence, there, there are steps towards that. Let's let's push on that. If there's nothing to do, do nothing. Uh, human and machine readability, it's great. And the OS is doing the heavy lifting. So may a thousand flowers bloom. We're in an, a university. It's like, oh, you're building an, an appliance, an appliance, an appliance. Well, each of those CS201 students should be able to create a nifty WebSocket interface or REST interface as just that monthly project and rinse and repeat over and over rather than fork the OS and then regret that, uh oh, we don't have 64-bit support. Oh no, what, what do we do? Do we change a diff to an OOS? Do we resynchronize, you name it? So in parallel to what I'm doing, there's some, there's some great activity from non-developers or pr production users and heavy users. So uh, in discussing jails, Antrenig uh, saw that yes, jail has an API. So he quickly banged out a Flua, FreeBSD Lua in base front end to jails because it's just an API, just talk to it. Don't reinvent anything. Uh, Jan goes by Crest. He's doing very clever work with CTL backend as a Verdio SCSI support mechanism for Beehive to have like pluggable SCSI devices. This is good. Uh, he also produced a WireGuard IC script going, which hopefully will make it into 14. It's gorgeous. <laughs> um, uh, John Debussy. He's looking at an NFS client within a Beehive VM so that if in a testing environment, that one VM can do some NFS stuff without breaking the host, especially when you know things are breaking. So that's cool. Uh, Dave is doing some really good things. Uh, his talk yesterday was fantastic on immutable BSD. Check that out. And there are weekly calls on jail, open ZFS, and Beehive. And last night at the social event, it's like, wait, most of the group is here. Let's just <laughs> let's at least get a photo. I almost instinctively started the recordings. Recordings are online. Everyone's welcome. Uh, this may change, but they're currently at BeehiveCon. It'll redirect. Uh, if you want to join a call, great. Uh, FreeBSD AM is Antrenig's Armenian site. I threw the link on beehive.org. It's organically become a ZFS call and needs a home, ZFS. And some quick thank yous in this last minute. <coughs> thank you, John Baldwin, for maintaining uh, Beehive and a thousand other things. Corvin, he's doing free, full time FreeBSD devel uh, Beehive development. Yes, he's here today. Hopefully, you saw his talk yesterday. Uh, Jamie Gritton, the Beehive, uh, the jail maintainer. Really nice guy. He's taking in ideas, processing them, and producing things like the dot include. Mark Johnston made the MakeFS uh, ZFS support work and a thousand other things. Christoph Provost, a faster bridge for virtual machines. Yay, thank you, thank you, Christoph. Um, and of course, Open ZFS. It's one of the few software projects that just gets better over time in a nice freight train manner. And everyone who's making these tools, amazing. So, thank you. Any questions? <laughs> the fire hose. <laughs> Louder? Flood the zone with greatness.
Others. And you can catch me other outside of this. I'm easy to find. Uh, yes, sir. So the question was, and I'll try to find the thing I shot right past regarding that. Um, I'll try to find it. Okay. So the question was, well, yeah, we quickly jump in, blast out a, a, a system. What happens over time? Maintaining it. But that's accurate. So just after doing that sort of pseudo item potent or hack around sysrc, I put an rc.local in the Occam BSD repo, which handles a whole bunch of other things. And again, things I have, I've been maintaining the same way for a decade or two. So the principle of least astonishment is your friend. The OS will generally not change on you or it will do so with warning. So to build that out, often once, you spend your time on Stack Overflow and whatever they call those to like find the said syntax to change something to your liking. That endures really well. And it's all a cart per thing you're configuring. And uh, I think one can safely step back and have pretty much idempotent storage arrays. We know where we want to be. We know what a bad disk looks like. And a human might have to get involved, but Knowing the OS and having the OS do so much for you, I'd say is actually a relief for adding what you want to add, rather than lightly forking the OS or heavily forking the OS. I hope that helps. Working with the OS, precisely. And I haven't seen anything like this elsewhere. I've politely asked other, like Illumos, are there build options? OpenBSD, are there build options? I'm just curious, because it's so cool that you can, NetBSD does, excellent. Uh, are there any tools to uh, use the NetBSD build options to tear it down and work your ba way back up? Let's try that. Well, I'll make a note on my paper here. So, NetBSD build options. Others? Yes, sir. So the question is, in Occam BSD, what's the point of making it smaller? I admit that I blasted through it pretty quickly. So what it does is initially turn on all build options. So basically, uh, like a firewall, block all, get rid of it all, and work your way, add things back. There are two or so options required to build, or else you get nowhere. And you can then step through. If you add networking, add networking, add PF, add PF, add Beehive, and I gave the example with the code of what that looks like. So it's not compressing, it's not doing anything exotic short of just not building what you ask it not to build. Does that make better sense? And I'll gladly sit down with you and you know, walk through the code. <laughs> but uh, it was such a pleasant epiphany to realize you can just work your way back up. <laughs> anyway, anything else? Last chance. Thank you so much.